We've been looking at four things that the Apostle Paul prayed for the believers in Ephesians chapter 1. He prayed that they might know the Father, that they might know the hope of his calling, that they might know the riches of his inheritance in the saints, and the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe. We are now discussing the second one, knowing the hope of his calling. So let's go back to Ephesians chapter 1, um, verses 15 to 21. I will read. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. Amen. So we started off this journey with uh, this scripture from Ephesians 1. And uh, we uh, said that there are four critical things which Paul mentioned that we might know. Um, he desired and prayed that God's people, through the multifaceted manifestation of God's spirit, would know these four things. That we would know the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we would know the hope of his calling or the hope to which he has called us. We would know the riches of the glory of the inheritance in the saints and the exceeding greatness of his power towards us. Last time we discussed uh, knowing the Father and how we need the Holy Spirit to help us. He will bring understanding, he will bring knowledge, he will bring wisdom and he will bring revelations to us through the word. Now. Today we're going to uh, look at the second thing Paul uh, desired that we should know. And that is the hope of his calling. In verse 18 it says that the eyes of your hearts being enlightened. Some version says the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. That you will know what is the hope of his calling. It's very important that we know the hope to which Christ has called us. Because without this hope, the Christian walk becomes a mere religious exercise. And without this hope, we live in fear, doubt, and unbelief. There are many other religions that have killed and are killing for this hope. So it's very, very important that we know. This hope is the essence of all human life and existence. Without this hope, Life becomes meaningless and purposeless. Paul prayed that we would know the hope of the Father's calling. The hope to which God has called or is reaching out to all humanity. But we have responded to that call and we need to know that hope. In order to understand Paul's prayer, we need to look critically at the two key components of the prayer. He prayed that the Father would give us the spirit of revelation, one, of his calling and the hope of the calling. So I want us to discuss the two components, the calling as the Father's calling and the hope of the calling. Many who have come to faith in Jesus Christ do not know or merely have a faint idea about our calling. Yes, we have been saved and uh, 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 we are Christians, but we do not have a comprehensive knowledge or understanding of our calling or that we even have a calling or we have been called by God. Now, by calling, I'm not talking about the specific ministry or area of service assigned to us. 
I'm talking about the corporate calling of all believers. Uh, let, let's, let's look at Ephesians chapter 4 to understand uh, what I mean. Because as believers, we have one calling. And uh, Paul described it in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 4. It says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope of your calling. There is one body, there is one spirit, and one hope of your calling. This scripture suggests that all believers have one calling in which we have been called, as there is one body and one spirit, and we have been called in one hope. We are therefore admonished to walk worthy of this calling. Now, let's talk more about this calling. The word calling refers to a call or a summons or an invitation from God to partake of the blessings of salvation from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And also it is used to describe those who have responded. God issues such an invitation or summons in Isaiah 55 verse 1 when he said, Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. In Matthew 22, Jesus talks about the parable of the wedding feast. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding. First of all, it is the father calling out to us through the gospel of Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes will not perish but have eternal life. So an invitation is given to all to believe in Jesus, that we might be partakers of the eternal promises of God. Now, those who respond to this divine summons become part of the church or the ecclesia. The word ecclesia means the called out one. So just uh, uh, picture this. God is calling to all. Those who respond and come are called the ecclesia, the called out one. Now this denotes an assembly of people called out for a particular purpose. And we have been called out from darkness, from the world, from our nations and our tribes and languages into the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Let's see how 2 Corinthians 6 addresses this. We'll look at verses 16 to 18. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Hallelujah. It is these very called ones who have God as their father. Hallelujah. Now I want, I want to discuss three more things about this calling. It is the father's calling. And I want us to look at three critical things about this. First of all, this calling is the holy calling. Paul said what? That we would know the hope to which we have been called. And we are looking first at the calling. And this calling is the holy calling. It sets us apart. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, he says, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with the holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. It is a holy calling that takes us out from the world. 
takes us out of the world. That's why the scripture can say that we are in this world, but we are not of this world because we've been called out, called out of the mindset of the world, called out of the systems of the world, called out of the way of life of the world, the traditions of the world. What is acceptable by the world is not acceptable to us. And it is a holy calling. To be holy means to be sanctified, to be set aside, to be consecrated to God. So we've been called out and have been consecrated to God. Wow. This is the calling of the church. Now, the second thing about this calling is that it's not according to our earthly, fleshly endowments. We have not been called because we are wise or we are mighty or we have riches. We have not been called because of any earthly qualifications we have. We have been called not according to any, any skill or any, anything, any works that we may perform for God. He says, for you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. This gives everybody a chance because it's not like a job or, or that you're going for and you, you have to have certain skills, certain qualifications and, and things be, be, before you are accepted. No, none of those. God has called us to his own purpose and will. And God has called all, irrespective of, in spite of, despite, we are all called. Hallelujah. The third thing about the Father's calling is that the calling relocates us. We have been called and separated and brought out of darkness into God's marvelous light. Awesome. We've been called. Just, just think of it. Called out. And God did not let us just uh, come into nothingness, but we've been called into his marvelous light. 1 Peter 2, 9 tells us, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we know that we have been called. And the calling is the Father's calling. And he has called us out. And he's brought us into his family. We are the church of Jesus Christ, the ecclesia, the called out ones. This calling is a holy calling. This calling is not according to our fleshly or earthly endowments. And this calling has relocated us into God and into his kingdom. Hallelujah. Now Paul's prayer is that we will know the hope to which we have been called. And that's what I want us to look at uh, uh, next. The hope to which we have been called. Did he just call us for fun? Did the father just call us just for the sake of it? Or did he call us for a purpose? Let's explore that further. But let's start with hope. What is hope? Because if we understand the meaning of the word hope, we will understand the things that God has prepared for us. Hallelujah. Now hope from the biblical perspective or the New Testament perspective is one of the three Christian virtues described in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, together with faith and love. It says, so faith, hope, and love, these three abide. Hope, faith, and love, these three abide. So this makes hope an essential and integral part of our Christian development and maturity. There is no way we can live without hope. We need hope as much as we need faith and we need love. So Romans 15 verse 3 tells us that whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15, Paul said of the, the, the Ephesians, says, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, 
Mm. They had developed faith. Paul knew about that, had heard of their faith in God. They had developed love, love for the saints. But Paul realized that they needed to develop hope, which is why he prayed that we might know the hope to which God has called us. Faith, hope, and love, these three abide. We need to develop hope, to build up hope, as much as we need faith and love. Hallelujah. Now, what is hope? Hope is an active expectation. Is an active expectation. Romans 8, 24 and 25 tells us, For we were saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. It means that hope is more than a mere desire or wish, but it's something we work at we, we, with expectation. We, we, we desire it and we persevere to attain it. If we've seen it, there's no need for us to hope for it. But everything we hope for is what we do not see or have not seen. And so we endeavor, we, 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 we strive, we persevere until we have obtained it. So hope is an active expectation. And Paul is saying that he desires that we would know the hope to which we have been called. The dictionary defines hope as both a noun and a verb. Now, as in a noun, hope is an ob objective. It means that hope is a goal. Hope is an end result that we will have. So if Paul is saying that you would know the hope of the calling, Paul is saying that we would know the end result, the goal of the calling, that the Father has something in mind, that there is an end result, there is a purpose, a reason to which we have been called. When hope uh, is used as a verb, it becomes subjective. That is, it describes the attitude of mind, the state of mind, or the experience of the person. So, on the one hand, hope can be a, a, a goal or a, an aim or end result of our calling. But at the same time, hope can be our daily experience as we await the end result. I hope it makes sense. We'll discuss more as we go on. But bear this in mind, that hope can be an objective, that is a target, a goal we are aiming to achieve, or hope can be a verb, which is a doing word, something we are doing and living and experiencing. Beloved in Christ, the Father has called us, and we have responded to that calling. The Father in his love has sent Christ, and Christ has restored us to himself through his blood. And he wants us to know that it's not just for fun, it's not just something he just did, but that he has certain things in his mind. The scripture says, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered the heart of man, the things the Father has for us. Yeah, I mean, that statement alone should stir up hope in us. It should stir up excitement in us. The Father needs us to have an experience of both hope as an object as well as hope as a lifestyle we are living daily. So let's explore this uh, further. We're first going to look at objective hope. That is the goal or end result of our calling. And by calling, I, I, I want to, to remind us that is not my, my uh, vocation or my uh, personal ministry or anything, but coming out of the world, being called out of the world into the kingdom of God. 
What is the objective hope? What is the goal? What is God's aim to which he called us? Now, the hope to which we were called, first of all, is eternal life. Eternal life. Not eternal death, eternal life. John 3, 16 to 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. But in verse 36, he says, He who believes in the son has everlasting life. Beloved, we've been promised eternal life. The objective hope, the goal that the Father has in mind is that we will have eternal life. Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden because God said, lest they eat of the tree of life. Lest they eat of the tree of life and forever are damned in their sin. But we can partake now of the tree of life. Jesus promised us that in the book of Revelation. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you. The sure mercies of David. Isaiah 55 verse 3. God has promised us eternal life. You know, these days people don't think, we don't think as believers of the afterlife. But God wants us to be reminded is that God has promised us eternal life. The alternative is eternal damnation, where we are cast into hell and we live so far away from God. But God has promised us eternal life. This is a sure victory we have over death. Hallelujah. I said the first is eternal life. The second hope to which we have been called is that we will be glorified. We will be glorified. This simply means that we will become like Christ, taking on his nature and characteristics. We're struggling here. We are struggling to overcome sin. We are struggling to overcome the world. We are struggling to overcome Satan. But a day is coming when that struggle will cease, when we'll take on the nature of Jesus Christ. Sin will be totally removed from us and the full image and glory of God will be revealed in us. Or when God created Adam and Eve, God created them in his image and sin damaged that image. But in Christ, that image is going to be restored to us. And now, even now, it's being restored. But we'll discuss that more when we come to subjective hope. But the, the object of our hope is that one day, we who have a right standing with God will be made like Christ and experience life in God's presence eternally. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My desire really is that we, we will, as believers, begin to think of these things because it makes all that we are doing, it gives meaning to it and makes it satisfactory. Romans 8 verses 28 to 30, New Living Translation says, And we know that God causes everything to work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. Hallelujah. That not only have we been chosen and called, We've been given a right standing with God himself. And having given us a right standing, he will glorify us. He will make us like Christ in nature and in essence. And this is what the Spirit has already begun in us. So our hope should be that one day we will be like him. 
The Bible says that when we see him, we will see ourselves. Because as he is, so are we. Hallelujah. The, the final object of our hope or goal of our hope is heaven. So we have eternal life. We have been transformed into the image of God. And we are called to heaven, dwelling in the presence of God. Hebrews 3.1 tells us that we are partakers of a heavenly calling. Hallelujah. Jesus assured us of this. Look, we need to develop a mindset of heaven because it's something that is lacking in the now. But Jesus said to us in John 14, verses 1 to 3, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We cannot imagine what heaven would be like. But at least we take confidence in this. We have a good God. And he said, I have plans for you and all my plans are for good. It means that heaven will be good. Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. Hallelujah. And, and heaven has been prepared for us. Jesus said, I have gone ahead and prepared mansions for you. Hallelujah. What will heaven be like? Oh, Revelation 7 tells us, They shall no more hunger, neither thirst. Neither shall the sun beat down on them or any heat, for the lamb in the center of the throne shall be their shepherd and shall guide them to springs of water of life, and God shall wipe every tear from their eyes. Oh, Revelation 22 tells us, And there shall no longer be any night, and they shall not have need of the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God shall illumine them, and they shall reign forever and ever. This is our hope. And this is what God is calling the world to. And this is what we as believers who have responded to the call must have at the forefront of everything we do. That one day when we cross over to the other side, it's not going to be an empty vacuum. If we believe everything we know, the scripture says about God. If we believe everything we have even studied about God in this uh, Four Things I Must Know series, then we know that God is faithful and his promises shall sure to come. Hallelujah. His promises are sure to come to pass. We shall not hunger nor thirst. We shall dwell in perpetual light. I, you know, one day I had a dream, and in the dream, the Lord showed me heaven. I pray, I pray, I pray, and I ask God, let me dream again. It was beautiful. I saw it from afar, and I was looking in the dream. I was looking for my camera to take a picture because I wanted to show it to everybody. And when I turned, the pic it had gone. And I heard the Lord say, it's only a mist that covers it. That what is between us and heaven is only a mist. And that when the mist is blown off, we will see. One day, we will become like God's son. Having overcome sin and made right with him, we shall dwell in his presence forever. This is the objective hope of the Father's calling. This is the goal to which we have been called. Many of us live without this expectation. Many of us are afraid of death and we think it's an end because we don't have this anticipation. Many of us are focused on this earth and so we are focused on the challenges. We are focused on our doubts and our, our, our fears. We are discouraged 
And it's difficult for us to press on. It's difficult for us to engage with God in the right way. Many of us are struggling, trying to make it on earth. When the things we are pursuing have no value for the hereafter. But if we will keep the objective hope of God at the forefront of our hearts and mind, we will know that the Christian life is worth living. This hope of life in heaven is not only a future expectation, it is also a present reality. Ephesians 1 tells us that we are seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Also, Jesus has given us access by giving us the keys to the gates of heaven. Hallelujah. And we will discuss this further when we look at the riches of the glory of our inheritance. But we need to know as believers that God has called us to a living hope. And it is a hope that we must press in to attain. This is what stirred Paul up to pray this prayer. May the Lord help us. May the Lord reveal these things to us. May the Lord give us understanding. And may the Lord give us the grace to press in to possess this goal of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.